hear me. Yes. Um, I'm just going to give a brief introduction uh, to the, so what I think about the sustainable urban mobility planning process. I'm part of a Horizon 2020 project called um, uh, Prosperity. And uh, as with many of these projects, we've been going around, going around Europe um, training various municipalities on sustainable urban mobility planning and so on. So I'll give my take on, on what sustainable urban mobility planning is, give a few ideas about what I think those cities, uh, towns, regions that have really achieved something in sustainable urban mobility planning, what they've done and how they've done it. And then also reflect a little bit about some of the, some of the, the challenges and including some of the new challenges that are coming out of new forms of mobility. Um, so <clears throat> as we can see there, <clears throat> I want to go through what sustainable urban mobility plan, why is it needed, what's it mean in practice, uh, give a few experiences, talk about some of the skills and capacities that I think are needed because it's a new way of working for many people working in transport and mobility and spatial planning um, and that means new capacities and new ways of working. Then just briefly what are these new forms of mobility that are coming up and, and um, how might they affect sustainable urban mobility planning but also what does that mean for sustainable urban mobility planning. And then finally, um, I just point you to some resources and tools for SUMP development. I, I mean, I hope this is fairly relevant to your conference, um, but anyway, it's too late now because this is the presentation that I prepared. <laughs> so here we go. Um, in the European Union's famous guidelines on um, SUMP from 2014, by the way, those are currently being updated and there should be some new guidelines out there uh, by, uh, by the middle of next year. Um, they define the sustainable urban mobility plan as this, a strategic plan designed to satisfy the mobility needs of people and businesses in cities and their surroundings for a better quality of life. It builds on existing planning practices and takes due consideration of integration, participation and evaluation principles. Now that's really two quite long sentences. So what I thought I'd kind of give you my take in big red letters. What I think is really fundamental to the SUMP approach is the idea of managing the transport system, managing the transport system. So it's not just about building infrastructure for many, many, many years. And still, I mean, I still see it in my city, which supposedly has had a sustainable urban mobility plan for 20 years. But I still see this sort of almost desperation sometimes to build infrastructure. But SUMP is not just about that. It's about managing the transport system. And it's about doing that to achieve wider societal objectives. So the objective is not to build the tram, although sometimes in my city I think the objective is to build the tram. But no, the objective is to build the tram because we want better access to somewhere or because we want a better economy. So that to me seems to be core to the SUMP and of course my big red letters there. That's a bit of a shorter sentence than the two sentences in black behind. <laughs> Um, you know, why do we need SUMPs? I find this very interesting. I suppose I could have put it on the slide directly, but I just have to explain it now. But, um, you know, in this country, in Britain, for the past 60 years, and in many other Western European countries, we've been building infrastructure, transport infrastructure, and a main justification for that has been to save time so that people spend less time traveling. So you would think that after 60 years of building all these schemes, that now instead of maybe spending an hour and a half a day traveling 60 years ago, we maybe only spend an hour. But actually, no. If anything, we spend a little bit more time traveling now than we did then. So we were predicting how much travel there was, trying to provide uh, for that, trying to save journey time. And if you look at it in a macro, uh, from a macro perspective, it doesn't seem to have worked. What's it, what's it brought about? It's brought about longer journey times and congestion. And then all those other things that stem from that, like the greenhouse gas emissions, the poor air quality, people uh, using less active travel, but also having the sort of poor mental and physical health effects of too much traffic and all those types of things. So, I mean, those are very good justifications for maybe saying, well, the approach, the paradigm that we've had for so long, Maybe it, it just it hasn't worked that well, and maybe we need to think about things in a slightly different way as we approach the management and improvement of our mobility systems. But we have to see our mobility systems as part of a wider system. You know, they're only a means to an end. They're a means for our societies to function 
and we need the society to function but not to have too many negative effects of that mobility system so those are good reasons for SUMP as well so some of the things that you know what's core to SUMP making sure we manage transport to achieve these wider objectives and what kind of wider objectives might those be well things like improved air quality uh, improved quality of life although quality of life is one thing to some people and one thing to another but certainly it should be something that transport contributes to improving quality of life uh, reducing congestion well, actually I prefer to see the reduction of congestion I would put it in another terms in other terms which is improved accessibility to what people need because congestion is a problem in that it reduces our accessibility to what we need to get to so what we want is improved accessibility and that helps us to think about what we do in a slightly different way um, improving social inclusion improved safety improved perceived safety maybe and so on and so forth so I'm not saying every SUMP should have all of these objectives all I'm saying is that an SUMP has to be structured around and have at its absolute core these type of wider societal objectives that transport contributes to but obviously other things contribute them contribute to them as well I mean a classic example is economy of the city in fact the links between transport and the economy are very hard empirically to sort of uh, to, to, to pull out and then there are many other things that are much more important to the economy but transport plays a role so transport should contribute to an improved economy the structure of an SUMP I hope you can see my mouse probably you can so you got the vision at the top what kind of what kind of place do we want what kind of city do we want to live in what kind of region do we want to live in that's got to be the the vision and then um, some kind of problem analysis looking at what problems there are related to transport that may not necessarily need mean that you need to spend two years gathering data and building a model when we look at the first SUMPs that were done in Britain in the late 1990s they had about six months to put together their SUMP so they were dependent on them um, on data that was already there and lots of them didn't have a model didn't have uh, travel surveys so we shouldn't get too hung up about data in the problem analysis um, setting objectives like the ones I had on the previous slides and then there's there's this issue of the strategy and I would really draw your attention to that because I think it's very important very very important um, obviously in order to achieve objectives I lost my mouse again we need to object to achieve objectives we need to ultimately implement things in the mobility system we need to manage our mobility system differently we need to uh, for example change the distribution of space on a street away maybe from private vehicles towards public transport cycling and walking that might be a measure on a particular street um, but if we just go straight from objectives to measures on particular streets uh, we get very bogged down in what those measures should be so to give an example um, safety safety improving safety some people will say to do that what you should really do is separate segregate the uh, vulnerable road users cyclists and walkers uh, from motor vehicles other people will say no 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 what you need to do is slow down the motor vehicles so everybody can kind of coexist on that street and those are two very different ways of achieving the objective of road safety and you can have long arguments about whether or not they actually do but the point is if you have a strategy you say well in general the way in our city that we will improve road safety is to for example slow down traffic so without talking about individual streets or individual schemes individual projects you set a strategy to say in general our approach to safety will be that we will slow traffic and those are political decisions I mean we can't get away from the politics of SUMP SUMPs are done by political organizations and that means political decisions but the, the idea of a strategy if you you can have the political discussion at that level thinking about how do we approach what we what we actually want to achieve um, <clears throat> and that will set some general directions of change that when it comes down to thinking about individual schemes on individual streets or individual investments then those strategies help to guide those right and I so that's why they're so important and if you want to read more about those I recommend the European Union's guidance on uh, measure selection within SUMP which is really quite a good document 
They're not all good, but that was a very good one. Um, approaches and measures for each mode are part of this. So you can see down here, if you turn your head to one side, preferably to the right, um, you'll see that there's uh, <coughs> cycling, walking, public transport. You, you know, you have measures within the SUMP, all of which are aimed at achieving the objectives. Something we've never ever been very good at previously in transport is monitoring, evaluation and review. We've tended to do a project and then just move on to the next project. But what's the point of that? We need to find out whether or not what we're doing actually contributes to the objectives, whether it's achieving our targets, um, what's changing. So that's why monitoring and evaluation and review is really good, because if you don't know whether what you're doing is actually having the intended effect, well, what's the point of doing it? And then again, if you turn your head to your to your right, <clears throat> um, apologies if I'm causing you pain, some pain in the neck, as it were. Um, <clears throat> integration with other policies, planning, health, environment, very, very important from the point of view, because transport is just part of our society, obviously, and has to be integrated with these other fields. But also that helps to get additional money. I mean, we find in Britain now that money for transport is coming from health, not just uh, from, from transport sources. And public consultation, public participation, is generally core or important in SUMP, but I would say that it's something that's very culturally specific and different cultures do this in different ways. And you've got to find your own way. Uh, my experience of living in Sweden, I thought Sweden would be a country where they do loads and loads and loads of public consultation, just endless public consultation. But in fact, um, they don't. It's, it was surprising to me to find out. And yet people are quite satisfied with their transport system. Um, so you have to find your own way to public consultation, uh, but doing a bit more of it usually doesn't hurt. Um, this is the sustainable mobility planning process from the SUMP guidelines produced by the European Commission. And you will actually find, if you look at this in careful, carefully in these 11 steps, you'll find many of the things that I've just talked about are reflected in this circle. Um, would say, by the way, that maybe there's an arrow missing there because this is meant to be a, a continuous cycle. Um, SUMP is a process, it's not just a plan. What's the meaning practice? There are quite a few myths actually about SUMP, like everybody has to sell their cars and SUMP wants to stop people from traveling and we'll never build any new infrastructure, things like this. But actually, what you find is that um, it's better to think about it in these ways. So instead of everyone having to sell their cars. No, some people might use their cars less um, and that type of thing. Uh, so I will just skip on. And it does mean planning for people and not just for transport planners and traffic engineers. I love this slide from Graz in Austria. Some of you may have seen it before, but um, it basically shows the modal, mode share for people of different um, of people from um, different demographics. And you can see that if essentially what the red is, uh, the red is car drivers and the yellow is car passengers. You can see that the, <clears throat> for all groups except men aged 20 to 59, then <clears throat> the mode share is more sustainable, public transport, cycling and walking in the majority. For men aged 20 to 59, car is in the majority. Um, I don't know what it's like in Italy, although I kind of imagine it's probably like what it is in Britain, that uh, transport planners and traffic engineers tend to fit into this demographic here. And SUMP, well, if it only reflects the views of this demographic, then it's not doing much for this demographic on the left. And I think that's really important to remember. What can be achieved? I'll skip over that. But for example, the city of Ghent in Belgium, as you can see on the left hand side in the 1980s, was very, very, very car and traffic dominated. You can see on the right that in certain parts of Ghent, particularly the city centre, but some arterial streets, space has been reallocated very differently to other modes and, for example, to street trees that didn't exist there before and less space for parking, less space for moving vehicles. Um, that's all very well. I'm sure you've seen pictures like this. But what I what I find interesting about this is that since the SUMP was implemented, population decline was reversed, people starting moving back into the city and economically, the city did better than um, than the other cities in in Flanders. And so I think that shows at least that you can have an SUMP and do these types of things to your city and that it won't stop your economy from growing. But I think it might be more than that. I mean, it's very difficult to show statistically, but it might be more than that, that actually the SUMP and the improved quality of life that it brought about 
actually attracted people and businesses into the city. But at the very least, it's not incompatible with economic growth and population growth. <clears throat> um, the city of Ljubljana, not far from where you are, of course, only 99 kilometers, I think. Um, so many of you may be familiar with it, especially some of the Slovenian uh, participants in the conference today. Um, but I think the city of Ljubljana shows how it's possible to, uh, well, significant, make very significant changes to uh, a city in terms of the distribution of street space. The way that people get around and various ways of managing transport, for example, in introduction of uh, bus lanes, introduction of, uh, of new parking measures, uh, and still prosper economically, in fact, prosper very significantly economically. I'll skip over a few here. Um, <clears throat> An example from Britain, unfortunately, uh, this data only got up to 2008 because the requirement to monitor what was going on only uh, went on until 2008. But this basically shows how in Greater Nottingham, a city in uh, in uh, the Midlands of, of England, um, they overachieved quite significantly against their targets for bus and tram passengers uh, as a result of their SUMP. <laughs> York in England also did uh, the same, overachieving against its targets for public transport. Uh, but you can see as a result of their SUMP, they also they grew their bus passengers by 45 percent, but they cut peak hour urban traffic. Um, they increased the use of non-car modes for trips to the city centre and they reduced road accidents as well. So SUMPs can work. Another example, a more recent example, uh, the city of uh, Vitoria Gasteiz in Spain, which is um, radically restructured its bus network, uh, radically changed the way that street space is allocated uh, away from parked vehicles in particular uh, towards pedestrians and cyclists and public transport, um, and has also increased its parking charges quite significantly. And uh, you can see basically there that the mode share for car after hitting a peak in 2006 of 37 percent has since fallen to 25 percent, which is really quite a significant uh, change over that period. What are the barriers in SUMP development? Uh, things like <clears throat> who are the, what are what are the organisational roles and responsibilities? Because often uh, SUMP is the is the responsibility of a planning department, but it's fundamental that you have traffic engineers and transport planners uh, in there doing SUMP as well. The political commitment to it. But I hope some of the examples I've shown have demonstrated that uh, you know it's possible to do these things and. Uh, still have a successful city, which I think is is, is one of the fears of many politicians that uh, if they somehow manage transport in a different way, it will have uh, economic and ne negative economic consequences. And I think there's lots of examples that show that is not the case. Um, <clears throat> poor integration between policies and plans, but then SUMP should, should, in theory, at least get transport planners spatial planners, traffic engineers talking to each other so that this integration might start to happen. Limited resources and skills. Um, sometimes a lack of funding for implementation in particular. So there's funding for the development of the SUMP, but less for the implementation. So I, I, um, I take my hat off to Slovenia for actually uh, using some of its um, structural funds to fund not only uh, development of SUMPs, but the implementation of SUMPs as well, implement SUMP measures. Although, by the way, I think you should be circumspect, cautious about how many park and ride sites you fund. Um, and limited public and stakeholder support. Well, yeah, but then if you do the consultation, if you do the participation in a clever way, as many Spanish cities have done, for example, Vitoria Gasteis, with uh, using something called a mobility roundtable of stakeholders who follow the plan and the development of the plan all the way through, then that can really help to build stakeholder support um, and lack of data or resources for monitoring and evaluation. But I think a key thing there is in terms of monitoring and evaluation, particularly for an initial SUMP, it's crucial to keep it simple. Um, collaboration is required in SUMP. I've done some work with Swedish colleagues. Of course, you might think they're the experts in collaboration, and perhaps they are. I know it's something kind of all deeply cultural that they have to collaborate all the time. But um, what are some of the, you know, I think these are generic, actually, recommendations for effective collaboration. Um, making sure that people agree why they're collaborating. Really spend some time getting a shared understanding of why they're collaborating. That's really important. Um, people participating from the start. Um, having some clear objectives, 
for the collaboration and what are you trying to achieve with the uh, collaboration, but who's meant to do what within the collaboration. Um, organizations that collaborate, you know, if they have representatives in a collaborative process, there should be some power to those individuals so that those individuals don't ha constantly have to go back to their own organization to check if what they're doing is all right. If there's any elephants in the room, difficult issues, and then get them on the table early and start talking about them. Don't avoid them. And uh, you need resources for collaboration. It's not something that necessarily you know, takes a short amount of time. Finally, um, just the move of the private sector into mobility services. Um, this is an interesting one. I'm on a, a European Commission um, advisory group uh, as part of the satellite project on, on this very this very issue. I mean, as you're well aware, the private sector is innovating new modes and services like shared ride sourcing, like Uberpool, for example. I have a PhD student doing some good work on that. Um, free floating car sharing, bike sharing with all its possible impacts on public space. Peer-to-peer um, -peer car sharing, peer-to-peer -peer parking sharing, where people uh, rent out the, any car parking spaces they, they might have on private ground. Um, and these type of things, they're, they're new services, they're new privately provided services that really that find a, a gap in the regulatory framework or look at the regulatory framework and see, well, we can operate within that regulatory framework. But their primary objective is to, well, maximize the information that they get from their users and possibly ultimately to make some money. So what from an SUMP perspective, if we want to um, use these or maximize the contribution of these types of mobility service, we need them to integrate with other modes and services. But to be honest, I think there's limited incentive for them to do that uh, unless they see that it's really, really going to grow their market. And to be honest, the, the evidence at the moment that it's going to grow their market if they integrate with other services is a bit limited. They need to protect their income and revenue. So unless public authorities play a leading role, setting I think maybe the word regulatory framework should be in here. Setting some kind of framework, I think it's it's going to be very very difficult uh, to get these these private sector operators um, to really become part of an integrated uh, transport system. But you, which, which then makes a bigger contribution to the objectives of SUMP. I mean, at the moment, there's a danger that some of these things actually work against the objectives of SUMP. For example, ride sourcing. Uh, companies like Lyft and Uber, because they go for where the demand is, this may mean that they actually contribute to congestion at the present time. So setting a framework is really, really important. And I must say that the uh, Integrated Transport Forum, part of the OECD, has done some really, really good work uh, on probably the most groundbreaking work that I've found on this issue of well, what, you know, what can public authorities do um, about these new mobility services. So I commend their work to you. Um, and I hope that you find it useful. So I think I've come to the end of my presentation now. I actually have to go and do some teaching myself now. Um, 